over 20,000 miles traveled and 13 listening sessions held, the Montana Stock Growers Association shared a recap of their producer profitability initiative during this year's mid-year meeting of the association. We captured their recap and what is in store for the next steps of this initiative. Thank you so much for joining us for this convention and for this conversation. Um, I guess I'll kick it off with just a question. Who hasn't heard of producer profitability? All right, so we did our job. We did a good job this spring. Um, and we're really excited to be with you this afternoon to kind of tell you about the next steps of that producer profitability. So for those of you who aren't familiar or weren't able to attend one of the meetings, we just wanted to give a quick background of where we've been. So this past December, um, we have grassroots, we're a grassroots membership uh, organization and we had members come to our annual convention and introduce uh, two or three policies and one directive regarding producer profitability. And really the goal of those po policies was to um, look forward and figure out a way that as an industry, the livestock industry could come together, unify, and um, work towards solutions that will make our industry sustainable for generations to come, as well as introduce or allow or bring solutions to the table to allow new people into the industry um, to join our, um, our great industry because we know that more people are retiring out of ranching than joining ranching, and at some point that, uh, that issue needs to be addressed and we want to address it. Following that, our board of directors did put together an internal task force from our board members. That group kind of identified five key areas that we wanted to focus on, and um, from there came the creation of our listening sessions. So our first listening session was launched in um, February at Pays and Billings, and we held um, multiple listening sessions across the state through the spring months. Um, in March and April, and we wrapped up our last listening session on May 13th in uh, Bronan on the west side of the mountains. So before we kind of dive into the content, we wanted to take this opportunity because this whole initiative would not be possible without some really great supporters and sponsors um, of the initiative. And so rather than recognize sponsors at the end, we wanted to take this opportunity to recognize our sponsors at the beginning. Um, if you are um, on this uh, slide, would you please stand up? I know a few of the, you are on the board, but I'm happy to report that this initiative has really sparked passion in a variety of different peoples. To date, we've raised $75,000 to work towards producer profitability initiative um, solutions, and we continue and invite others who are passionate about that to um, join in on that effort as well. So, uh, wouldn't be possible without um, all of these sponsors, so if you are here in the room, will you please stand up to be recognized? Thank you guys so much. A big shout out to the Livestock Marketing Association and all the Montana local auctions as well. They hosted all of the meetings for us, so it was great to be able to kind of have a, a, a continued partner as we traveled the state at the locations that we held our meetings. The other fun part of our meetings was our partnership with BI and Western Ranch Supply, and I see them in the front as well, and I'll have you guys stand up to be recognized as well. But they provided a vaccine cooler at each of our events that we were able to draw for participants, and I will tell you, people were like aggressive about that. They wanted to win those vaccine coolers, so thank you guys for your partnership and your willingness to support the Producer Profitability Initiative as well. So please stand up and be recognized. So I'm being told our AV is now ready to go. So before we dive into our discussion, let's take a look at what the meetings and listening sessions around the state looked like. This meeting is really about all of us. And this isn't just about stock growers, this isn't about whatever affiliate you're with. It's about trying to come up with some answers that really make a difference for us to make a better future for our industry. There are less younger people wanting to come into our business than there are going out. What can we do to make it attractive for the younger generation to come back?
So we took the opportunity to video every um, session that we held around the state. Uh, most of our sessions lasted about two, two and a half hours of conversation. And those can be found on our website at mtbeef.org um, and the producer profitability page. All of the listening sessions are archived, as well as a place for you to input any feedback, comments, thoughts um, for our leadership team and our organization. There's a forum that you can submit those to. So hopefully today's conversation kind of sparks some additional thoughts and comments from you. We'd love to hear from you. Um, just because the listening sessions are over doesn't mean the conversation's done, so we invite you to help us continue that conversation as we move forward. So we did, as I mentioned, have listening sessions all spring, and so what, what's more fun than to kind of put together some facts for you and, and statistics? These are very high-level statistics, but um, fun to look at. So uh, we held 13 meetings across the state. Uh, over 1,000 ranchers and farmers have participated in our producer profitability initiative. And I think that's really important. And we recently went back to Washington, D.C. in April. And uh, for us to be able to tell the story that hundreds and now thousands of people have shown up to participate in this conversation really made a huge impact for our uh, lawmakers and legislators. So. Um, Thank you all for who, all who participated and showed up to these meetings. We also um, really want to focus on a message of unity as we go around the state, and, that, and Leslie will be talking about that a little later, but wanted to highlight that we had six different producer organizations attend our producer profitability, which is a huge success and really one of the goals that we wanted as we went out. Um, we didn't want it just to be a Montana stock growers conversation. We wanted it to be ranchers from across our state's conversation. And so we had people from Montana Farm Bureau, Farmers Union, Montana Cattlemen, RCAF, U.S. Cattlemen's, and even uh, we had representatives from grain growers at one of our meetings because as we continue, some of these are livestock issues, but when it comes to estate taxes, our allies and partners in the grain industry can be just as powerful of advocates as, as our livestock industry. And the funnest stat, um, and Ian Kane's probably not in the room, but he was in charge of calculating this statistic, was uh, between the staff and officer team, we traveled over 24,000 miles um, across the state in the last eight to nine weeks, which um, commend and a thank you to our staff because that is a lot of road time and a lot of time away from home. Um, the fun fact that Ian also provided with that is that, does anybody know why that number could be significant? Oh, yes. Yes, it is the circumference of the world almost. So we, uh, we had some miles underneath our belts by the end of this uh, conversation. So great job, Carrie. <laughs> All right, so one of the items, and, and we'll kind of dive into this as we uh, continue our conversation, but one of the interactive components of our listening session was a survey that we surveyed the audience. And we know some of you have participated in the listening sessions already, but some of you have not. So we wanted to take this opportunity to gauge some of your thoughts and feedback as it relates to producer profitability. And this is um, what we call a mentee survey. So if you all wanna take out your cell phones, and I see Ian just popped in, he's our tech support to help people with their mentee surveys if you have any um, questions. Yep, one more. Oh, I can click it, okay, perfect. So you can go to menti.com or you can take a picture of this QR code and you will see the um, code, uh, which is 54524888. And we thought it would be a great opportunity just to quickly have you guys go through this interactive exercise. Uh, what's fun about this survey is that real-time results pop up on the screen, so you'll be able to see what your peers are submitting in real time. And we'll quickly go through this um, and then share a little bit about what we've seen and heard across the state. So if anybody needs help, feel free to raise your hand. One of our staff members will hop over to you and assist with that. Really? Really? Really, yeah. So when we would go through these, we'd always say, hey, this meeting's not about us up here, it's about you. And so we really would encourage as much participation as possible 
just to give every avenue for all producers to be able to give their thoughts, for us to be able to record them and really try to get a feel for the, the feelings of what producers are saying. What was really neat, and we always would talk about this, is, you know, we did, we went to virtually every corner of the state, and there's a lot of diversity in this state, but we had a lot in common. And that's been really, uh, really neat to see. And as you uh, see the answers come up onto the, on the board here, uh, Ray Lee will uh, uh, share the, the smaller ones, but this really helps us provide a roadmap. You know, what do we really need to do to help producers? And so please, I really encourage you to participate through this. All right, so if you are logged in, you will see the first question on your screen. If not, you might have to hit refresh. But our first question to ask you is, when you think about producer profitability, what are three words that come to mind? And you'll see if you're not familiar, this is what is called a word cloud. So as words start getting submitted, they start populating this cloud. The bigger or bolder the word, word the more times it's been submitted um, by multiple people. So really just a fun way to see um, what's on the minds of everyone in the audience. I think sustainability has been a um, driving theme throughout all of our listening sessions. and. Um, really fun to see that while we have differences maybe geographically on some of the topic areas um, some of these items and I have a word cloud from the overall listening sessions later on um, but there's some common themes across the state as well all right so we'll give you a couple more seconds and then we will move on to the next question In 20 words or less, share with us the biggest challenges you face in your operations growth and success. It's a little harder for me to see, but we're seeing access to land, labor, land, capital, no next generation, regulations, taxes, price takers, input costs, big money dividing the price of land, time. All right, next. In the last 10 years, what tools or programs have been the most beneficial to your operations profitability? This has also been an interesting uh, topic because we've seen things from government programs or management styles to things like uh, Rancher Stewardship Alliance or, you know, local programs that have been developed to kind of help uh, local producers be successful or more profitable within their communities. All right. And a lot of conversation has been around succession planning as well. So we'd like for you to self-identify and share with us where within the succession planning process you identify. You're a young producer entering the business or transitioning you do not have a succession plan. You're in the process of finalizing succession plan. You have a succession plan, or you're planning to exit the industry. And so when I spoke earlier, we talked about our task force identifying five key areas that we really wanted to use as uh, themes as we opened up conversations within our producer profitability listening sessions. Those were taxes, government programs, barriers to entry for beginning or new producers, labor challenges, and mentorship opportunities. We would like to hear from you and have you rank which of those categories you feel are the most important to um, the, I wouldn't say least important, but rank them from one to five on priority or what Montana stock growers should be focusing on. So as folks are wrapping that up, let's dive into a little more of where we've been and what we've heard and where we're going, Leslie. Um, it was no coincidence that this mid-year meeting, we actually, our theme was uniting to protect the future of ranching. Um, and part of that in the directive that we received at annual convention was about unity and being leaders and bringing the industry together. So can you just share a little bit about what we've done and what our vision is to kind of help unify the industry? 
Sure. So those of you who may not know who I am, Leslie Robinson, I'm the first vice president. We ranch uh, near Zortman. Um, first of all, I just want to ask how many of you here were able to attend one of our producer profitability meetings? Quite a few of you. Thank you. Thank you for attending because uh, it was just great to have these meetings across the state and, and our goal, like Rayleigh said, was to unify and figure out what issues we can all come together on and maybe it's only one, maybe it's two, maybe it's three. We just need to identify which issues those are that we can agree with, with uh, maybe not all of the organizations, but maybe we can get all of the organizations together. And when we had these meetings, we set aside, we started the meetings and Turk would talk about what issues we were not going to talk about because we knew that we were not going to come into agreement on those issues, we were not gonna be on the same page. And so our focus was to find what issues we could work together on. And uh, as we go through this panel, you'll kind of see the ones that rose to the top that I think that there's a possibility that, that we could all actually agree on something and try to accomplish that. And I know we're gonna talk about um, Washington DC a little bit at the end, but uh, when we talked about the unity part of that, when we talked to our congressional delegation, uh, their eyes kind of lit up because that's what is important is to try to find, you know, what, what we can accomplish together. And I think that we were successful already because of the diverse groups that came to our meetings. By far, they were not just Montana Stock or our members. They were members of of all of the organizations and the leaders from the different organizations. So I think we're on the right track and we have a commitment to keep going with that. So one of the opportunities that came from that and, and we get a lot of questions about like what's next or what are we going to do next is um, that we have had outreach from other organizations to host similar roundtables at their meetings um, this summer or moving into the future. Uh, John, do you have any thoughts about, um, and, and our board had a lot of conversation yesterday about opportunities where we can kind of continue to lead um, the industry and, and engage with other organizations? Well, Sure, and engaging with other organizations, as you say, we've done a lot of that already, um, primarily with different state affiliates of NCBA, but not exclusively. We've talked to other people as well. There is interest. We're going to be moving forward with some of that stuff. But, you know, one, one of the keys now we all have to decide is, is how, do we, how do we convert what we've heard into an action plan? And as we have more meetings... We, we continue to hear more, and, and as we hear more from different parts of the country, uh, that may change it some, but, but moving from just listening to an action plan is going to be one of the most important steps. And one of the, oh, could I ask is going to add, too, that I forgot to say, when we went to the NCBA convention, we did meet with um, the two different times that we went, uh, we did meet with other states and kind of told them what we were up to and... Uh, encourage the other states to take on the same initiative that we have started in Montana. And I know Wyoming has a policy for that. And that's a great segue to my question for Turk. So Turk, we have had the opportunity to talk to a variety of different state execs, um, our organizations, and some people have taken note and are implementing listening sessions. Do you want to just talk about the, the conversations that we've had and what we're seeing in the country around the... Uh, in yeah, the sure. industry around the country? Absolutely. So, um, you know, I got to give a lot of hats off to our staff because, you know, when you, when you take this listening session across the state, what is the best format? And, uh, you know, there was a little bit of evolution there, but, man, I tell you, this format was very effective. And we got a lot of interaction and obviously a lot of just response that's recorded that you can, you know, go and uh, resource. And... As this evolved, virtually you can see the virtually the fire beginning to build. And other states, as we have talked to other state stock growers organizations and, and shared with them of our reaction and the responses 
that we've been getting from members are just, you know, they're real Montana farmers and ranchers trying to make a living. And we've had emotional responses. We have had so many thank yous. And as we have shared that story with other states, there's other states now um, virtually mimicking this format. And that's gonna start, actually Alabama is gonna start this, uh, their listing sessions here in June. And, um, um, and I just uh, heard that there's uh, some other listing sessions starting to start in, uh, around the Wisconsin and Iowa area. And we've heard from even our neighboring states and obviously talking with Wyoming. And so really what we've started, and this came right down to our directive, as Leslie said, is we are here to try to be leaders and unify our industry exactly the, from the directive that this body passed in, in uh, um, December. And it's happening. And it's, it's humbling, it's exciting, and, uh, and we're, you know, truthfully, I feel like we're just getting started. And, um, and it's just, this is gonna continue to build. And I really am excited to see what we can do, not only from a state standpoint, but from our, uh, our industry as a country and because we really believe this is a national security issue of these topics that we're bringing forward to be able to feed our country. And when you put it in the proper context of the reality, everyone is on the same page. And all of the states are starting to say, hey, hey, how can we do this too? So let's dive into really some of the main themes. And while we just wrapped up our listening sessions two and a half weeks ago, our board of directors met yesterday and really had a great conversation about some of the um, solutions that we're starting to work on and develop as we move into the next steps. Uh, our, our packet of meeting notes as well as our um, survey results is about this thick double-sided so we have a lot of information that we're going on and going through um, as as we speak but it is not a surprise and based off the surveys that we just saw this afternoon as well of the rankings it is not a surprise that our tax climate is top of mind for many people and the need to ensure that our tax climate is favorable for ranchers across the country. So John, do you want to hit, a, hit on a little bit about what our boards talked about regarding tax and what maybe next steps could look like for us? I almost hesitate to because so many people in the room have been to the meetings already and heard this already and if they weren't at our meetings earlier, uh, they just heard Mark touch on a whole lot of this. But, uh, yeah, you look at tax climate as taking in a whole lot of different areas, but, but the very big one, of course, is the death tax. And, you know, at this point, I think everybody pretty much knows this, but the, the current estate tax law we have is, is set to sunset at the end of next year, 2025. And it will sunset, and right now, we have a death tax, but there is a an individual exemption that's inflation adjusted. So today it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 13 and a half million. So for a married couple, roughly 27 million. If, if that were to sunset and go away, it reverts back to the old number, which with inflation adjustment is back there somewhere in the five and a half million, somewhere in that neighborhood, significantly less. The point is, if that were to change, there's a lot of operations in this room that are not covered by $27 million. But if we're talking four or $5 million, that's gonna take in almost every operation in this room and a whole lot of Main Street businesses, not just farms and ranches. So that's, that's kind of devastating. And, and remember again what I said, that there's a lot of things that we worry about Congress doing something. And if Congress does something bad, at least we can, feel a little bit comfortable because Congress doesn't get much done, so they don't do much bad. You know, last year they passed 34 bills. But that's not the case with this one. We can't sit around and hope they do nothing. If they do nothing, this sunsets, and that's where we go back. So we need Congress to act on this. And, and as Mark very well pointed out, it, it's just a bad, unfair tax for a lot of things. So there's you know, there's some things we could talk about as fallback position. What do we really need? But, but at the end of the day, we need complete elimination of it. Now, 
with that saying that, you know, okay, so we want complete elimination of it, but what are other important things? Obviously, you know, high exemptions, if we still have it, are important. We've talked about, you know, Section 179, the bonus depreciation, how important those are. Stepped-up basis is, is very key. Um, special use valuation, which is so small right now, it's not, it's not even very meaningful to a lot of people. And, and actually, in some of Biden's new tax proposals, that's one of the good things in there is that they actually talk about increasing the special use valuation, although I, I maybe shouldn't say one of the good things. It might be the only good thing in those proposals because there's not much else in there. Uh, but we need to look at, at all these things as, as part of the picture because they're very important. Other things. And another one that keeps getting pointed out to us, of course, as bad as the death tax is, it only occurs upon death, whereas capital gains tax is prohibiting transfer of ranches while people are still alive because you can't sell it to the next generation or something. As long as we have inflation, all these properties are increasing in value and you've got a low, low cost basis, you're gonna get nailed with capital gains tax if you sell it. So these are all the things. In addition, I mentioned briefly earlier, uh, we're working with the Department of Revenue on the, on the property tax level in the state of Montana on the ag land classification. So um, I, I, that's probably way more than enough on taxes. Well, I'm glad that you highlighted capital gains task because uh, what was one of the most impactful things that we heard while we were around um, traveling around was real stories of people trying to um, bridge that gap of either transitioning out of the industry, helping the next generation get into the industry, or finding a new couple to kind of mentor and bring into the industry. But while they were trying to do that and make it pencil out and, and mentor a young couple or a new couple, um, they were also getting hit with significant capital gains taxes. So. Um, while that is a challenge and something that I think that we can definitely work on, the stories, Turk, were so impactful as it relates to succession planning, mentorship. Um, can you highlight just a few stories that you heard that you felt really, you know, packaged up nicely what, what our industry is doing? Yeah, sure. So, you know, our whole context of this, this initiative is we need to be able to keep this land in production and we need to be able to replace ourselves. And so maybe we don't have the children that want to come home, or maybe we don't have children. And so what are we going to do about it? Because over time, we're on the wrong trend line. And so, you know, what are the tools and the solutions? And we really heard some pretty awesome stories, what we were calling mentorship, of where there are existing operations out there trying to mitigate these barriers to entry. Now we've seen on your own responses here, and we've seen it 13 other times, we can't get access to land, we can't get access to capital. And if you just start flat-footed, is it even possible to get into ranching? Well, I'm sure most of all of you would say, there is no way. You know, someone's gonna have to give you a hand up. And so we shared a lot of stories where, or we asked for share, stories to be shared, and to where we've heard stories to where, you know what? There was this ranch that gave me a loan, and it was a favorable loan to help me get some cows started. There was stories to where like, hey, we are, we are a couple, we don't have children, and we want to be able to work with another couple to try to take over this ranch over time. And so as we share, we've heard these stories, then we talked about, okay, well maybe we, we price this well to where you can maybe pay it with a cow. But now are, you, are the people that were trying to do the goodwill, are they going to get into a tax jam? And so we talked through those type of situations. We talked about when we were at Dillon, hey, I need to, you know, we were talking about maybe you don't need a lease at the highest price out there. Maybe you need a lease to someone that is really trying to get going. And that was a great discussion because after the meeting, a young person came and talked to me and goes, you know, I really wanted to say something, but actually the people that I'm bidding against were in the room. And so the stories were emotional and they were real. And what was great about it is all recorded and we want to follow up with all that. And so 
how are we going to make this all useful is we need to get it bundled up like what John was saying is, is how can we, and, and Les was saying, how can we work together as a win and, and say, you know what? This industry needs a win. And we need to change the trend line of more producers going out of this business than coming in. We need to make sure the trend line, that there's enough land out there for us to be able to even feed our own country. And we have to be able to work together as an industry. And we think that we are on the path to be able to do that. Where we're seeing, just out of we're being humble here, because we're seeing other states follow suit. And to be able to start to tell those stories and share those solutions. Because as we would say, you know what really comes down to it? Is we're going to have to take care of our own. And we're going to have to say, you know what? I heard Jack and Diane's story and how they helped another couple get going. Or I heard how this ranch gave this other young person a loan that, you know what, it was pretty darn favorable to help them up and get them going. And we can't share that enough. And we really believe, I think this is just the start of a, of a great movement. You know, our staff has the ability that even today, if you have other ideas, you can go out to mtbeef.org and make a response even today. Hey, you know what, I heard a story that was pretty neat. And we want to be able to continue to share those stories because we really are seeing them make a difference. To the point, at one of them, in western Montana, they said, hey, you know what? I have a th thousand head feed yard. I would love to help a young person take this over. Or he, I was even at an event here a week ago where a young couple says, you know what? I heard you guys on the radio. And how would I get how can I participate in this mentorship program? Because we don't have any children. And we want this ranch to stay in production. There's no doubt that every person here has the same opinion, that there was a generation before you that had blood, sweat, and tears to get it to where it is today. And or maybe you started it. And what you had to do to get it to where this point is, there's, there's no better feeling to see that be able to continue on for long, long into the future. And those stories were very impactful, really. I just want to add, too, that every time I left one of the meetings, and I attended several of them, I just had a, a positive, good feeling about it. And part of it was just all the people that took the time, two and a half hours out of your day, to, to come and participate, and the diverse group, and just hearing everyone, and just, I don't know, just like some hope in their... Uh, in their comments of trying to find a solution. And it, like I said, it just, just was a feel good time. You know, I could add a few, a few more positive stories and unfortunately some negative ones. Uh, on the positive side, the things Turk talked about, and, and it was impressive the number of young producers that we talked to that talked about their, their, their struggles, you know, the working on the ranch and working the side job in town and needing help from some mentor or somebody that was helping them out in all these situations, that they talked about this with an attitude. They weren't complaining. They weren't whining. They were just, this is what it takes to make it work, and this is what we're doing. And, and that's a very positive attitude. Uh, and I guess maybe this is a little more the negative side, you know, as, as I heard all this, and nobody was rude enough to say this other than myself, but as I listened to all this, it occurred to me, when we talk about barriers to entry for young people, the largest barrier to entry for young and beginning producers is old and existing producers. And, <laughs> I mean, that's just the reality. The, those of us that have places, we don't necessarily want to give them up. We don't want to do succession planning. We don't want to do estate planning. We're going to run this ranch the way we like running it until we drop dead. And, and if we've worked hard all our life and built some wealth in that operation, we don't want to sell it at below market value. And some people do. And, and those are the people Turk talked about that are an inspiration. But, but most don't. And these are just realities we need to live with. So, John, you kind of highlighted that, that while we heard from a lot of young producers wanting to get into the industry, a lot of them were saying, but I have a, a town job or I have this other job and I can't pencil it out. But then, on the other hand, we heard from a lot of people saying, 
I can't find anybody to work for me in labor. And labor became a huge topic as well. And so, Turk, I know that's something that you're really passionate about. Do you want to kind of dive into some of the challenges? Because heard, we heard from a producer that was like, if I don't have an H-2A worker, I'm going out of business. And the challenges people are facing there. Yeah, and that, that person was in western Montana. They do a lot of irrigating. He says, if I lose my H-2A worker, I'm done. And you know what? That's been a sediment in many, in many scenarios where, you know what? There's been a lot of producers. They're working, working, and they're tired. And if they can't continue to have, you know, an H-2A program, they're just, they're at a point where I've just had enough. And so the H-2A program came up a lot and the challenges with the H-2A programs. You know, H-2A is a, is a, is a program that brings in foreign workers from other countries and they're here on a temporary basis. But they sure fill a need. And what happens is, is what we talked about, you know, you might be able to find someone that's willing to dr drive your $500,000 tractor with the AC and the refrigerator in it. But to find that livestock worker that's willing to go chop ice when it's 30 below and he's got to do that tomorrow, too. And he might even have to do it two times a day because the wind's blowing. That seems to be a worker that's harder to find all the time. And, and who are we going to do? Who, who's going to do it? And so a lot of producers are really moving towards the H-2A program. Is it a solve-all? No. But what a lot of this, and we can talk through all that, these are all tools. And we were asked to look at these tools and see if you can fix them. And the H-2A program was definitely one that we heard loud and clear. You need to fix this program. Help us fix this program. I feel like I can go to Texas with my gooseneck and get more foreign workers easier than for me to come up here and follow all of this paperwork and, and to get them on time. There was another scenario where this uh, producer, I want to say was his worker, supposed to be here in February, and we were having the meeting in April, and he says, I gotta leave the meeting early because I gotta go pick up my worker. So just think about that. I mean, that was a lot of time where he just didn't have the help he needed and he was planning on it. And that was 100% due to bureaucracy and a very, very, very slow program. And it doesn't take much. If you didn't cross the T or dot the I right, you can get it pulled away from you. And H-2A and all of the immigrant programs really need some major reform. And we have that on the list of a high priority as well, too. What, I just want, one thing that I was really surprised about across the state was how many people have had H-2A workers that I was unaware of. Um, there were, um, I remember Chinook, there were several people in Chinook that spoke about H-2A workers. So uh, it's way more prominent than a lot of people realize. The only thing I'd mention briefly is that, and as Turk already said, we're going to get to work. This is going to be one of our top priorities, looking at how we can work on, on immigrant programs, including H-2A. But yet that's not the only solution. We haven't completely given up on, on hiring people in this country either. And, and there's other tools we think we need to explore of, of finding ways also to find not just immigrants, but how can we find people that are native to this country that we can also get to do these jobs as well? Absolutely. In addition to the H-2A government program, we talked about a couple other different uh, government programs, one being FSA's beginning farmer and rancher program and LRP were kind of the, the two programs that we talked about a lot. Um, yesterday within our board meeting, uh, we actually developed a committee to kind of start diving into the details of the young farmer and rancher, beginning, sorry, beginning farmer and rancher program, uh, which again, part of that is what is young because uh, many of the people who, qual we had 22 year olds saying they didn't qualify anymore because they had been engaged for 10 years and we had 56 year olds saying they were part of the beginning farmer and rancher program because they had never ranched before. Um, does that matter? Maybe not, probably not, but it's a conversation that we think we need to dive deeper into. So John, do you want to just highlight some of those, I, I, I hit on the age, but some of the other tasks that we hope that this working group will kind of start looking at? Well, yeah, I think, I think you hit on a, a lot of it, but 
The, one of the great things we have, because the staff did such a great job of you know, recording these word, cl word clouds, recording the meetings, taking notes, getting this all that we have, well, as, as Ray Lee pointed out with the thick file, and that real, actually, that's not all of it. Yeah. There's, there's more than that. And, and so we can look at on an issue like it, if we want to work on beginning farmer and rancher programs, who do we need to call on and work on that? And we can say, well, you know, at the meeting in Three Forks, there was a young person that stood up and said this, and we know who it is, we're gonna call them. At the meeting in Glasgow, somebody talked about it, that's a good person we should call. So we can pull on those resources and get different people involved in solving these problems, which is, again, it goes back to grassroots, we're always gonna be better off if we can get those people to help solve these problems rather than Turk and Leslie and I trying to come up with all the answers. So that's positive. But, but yeah, back to Ray Lee touched on this a lot, but, and, and is it right or wrong? I don't know, but for the people that have been involved in, at an early age, yeah, like I said, there's, there's 22 year olds that no longer qualify as beginning ranchers because of what they did. And we heard, I remember specifically one guy in Ronan talking about We've got places here being sold to people who have made a lot of money somewhere else and retired and they're moving in here in their late 50s and 60s with lots of money, buying these ranches, and they can get government programs to help put up center pivots because they're a beginning rancher. Is, is that what beginning rancher programs should be for? I don't know, but like Ray Lee said, that's a conversation to be had. And Turk, I know something that you liked, uh, had a lot of comments on and, and engaged with in the listening sessions was LRP. Let's hit on that real quick, uh, and then we'll talk, Leslie, a little bit about what we our DC trip looked like. Yeah, so, you know, LRP was uh, actually in our resolution to talk about, and uh, livestock risk protection, and what, what we kind of evolved to was an awareness and a little bit of an education, because there was many producers that were not aware that this is a tool. You know, when you start talking about government programs, especially in the livestock industry, you're not going to get everybody on the same page if that's a good idea or not. You know, when you talk about this is a subsidized option, you know, not everybody likes the idea that there's some sort of subsidy going into the livestock world. Well, but it's still a tool. And we weren't there to debate if that's good or bad. We're here to make sure that you as producers know all the tools that already exist. They're already there. And how can we help make you aware? And then also talk with the producers that are using LRP and say, hey, is it working? How can we make this better? And we did hear back, you know what? This needs to be more competitive. It's too expensive. If I own a feed yard in Shepherd, Montana, and I buy cattle off the Northern Video in June, and I take price risk that day, I should be able to use LRP that day because I have the price risk. Right now, I can't do that as a buyer. So we've had very in-depth discussions about how LRP not only can be used, but we've also had major discussions on how can this be even a better tool for producers, and we're, taking, we're already discussing that as well. Absolutely, and you hit on uh, producer education and the importance of that and making sure everyone knows the tools that are available. But on the flip side, we recently went to Washington, D.C. and met with our congressional delegation in addition to some House and Senate committee staffers. And there's an education component there as well. So, Leslie, do you want to highlight a few things from our trip um, as it relates to producer profitability? Sure. Kind of jumped the gun earlier, but... Uh we did attend, we went to all of our congressional offices. Now we have four, which is great. Um, I do want to give kudos to Senator Danes' staff because they came to most of our meetings, took uh, lots of notes. And so when Senator Danes spoke this morning on his video about our producer profitability initiative, it was because his staff gave him all the information from the feedback that they were hearing at those meetings. So I think that's great. Uh, we were uh, very well received from all the offices. Like I said before, they were impressed with the number of diverse people that were attending our meetings and the fact that we're trying to unify uh, with a voice on, on issues to come to them. And we didn't 
We told them we don't really have specifics. We went through what our five topics were, but at currently we didn't. We were halfway through, so we didn't have specific uh, asks of them. But some of this, th some of these things are very timely. Like's been mentioned already with the estate tax and with uh, the farm bill being finalized. Who knows when? But some of the some of the things that we, we may want uh, are very timely, and so we need to uh, see you know what what our asks will be. But like uh, everybody was uh, listen to us, their staff um, follow up and ask more questions. So I think that it, it was a very uh, successful trip. So at our conversations with the board yesterday, the comment was made. What now? And we kind of talked about short-term and long-term goals. We also talked about the amount of response and feedback that we received probably is a three to four year work plan. Um, it, this conversation can go on. There'll be many different steps as we kind of move uh, through what those next steps are. I'm gonna ask each of you, what are, uh, in, in your final thoughts or closing comments, what are your hopes for where this goes and what maybe is your greatest goal or desire for any immediate or long-term outcomes. Turk, I'm gonna start with you. You looked like deep in thought there. Sure. Well, the next step is we need to continue to unify the industry. I think what we did is we showed the industry that you know what, you can bring all of the agricultural organizations together and have a civil conversation to say, you know what, we have more in common than we have not in common. And we really do all love this industry and love the legacy that we are a part of to make it a great future to continue to raise our families and do business in. And I think that was a big win that we, sh that we showed not only Montana, but I really feel that we showed the nation from the response that we're getting from the other states. And so we need to continue that and we are continuing it. I also believe, you know, next step is how do we follow up and, and sort through all of this and what is the highest priority? And when if we had our board meeting yesterday and the exec and the task force continue to meet and that's what we're going to, what we're going to decide. Because ultimately we need to try to find at least one topic that this industry can work together on. And if that's a state tax, or what it is. It seems like a state tax is the hottest topic, but can we go to all of the different organizations and say, you know what, for one time, for the benefit of the United States, livestock industry and our food production, can we agree on one thing and come together and be able to go to our senators and our congressmen, not only in Montana, but across this country and make a difference and get the American farm and rancher a win. And I really believe we're just getting cinched up for that. Because you, what you see here is, is the officer team. And so you at least have got another four years that we're gonna really make this a high priority. So Turk took a lot of my stuff, but um, <laughs> the unity to me is a big thing. And the fact that, uh, that we went out, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about going out into the communities, I guess, and I liked, I really liked, and I've said it several times, that we were able to pull in people that weren't just Montana Stock or our members, because if we only listen to the same people all the time, good people, love you all, but we need to have diverse uh, conversations, and I think that that was a really important thing that we did, and I would like to continue that, and also, like Turk said, a promise that this isn't just one and done. We are not going to just compile all this information and then go put it on a shelf somewhere. This is an ongoing uh, process that we will continue to look at the comments and, and use this uh, as we go forward. Final words, President Grandy. Well, I do a little repetition as well, but yeah, back to the short term and long term. We need to look at what we can get done right away. The, uh, again, the, the top thing is, is the death tax. The, the good news is there, 
we're not starting from ground zero on this. You know, Mark's team, Colin and Ethan and Kent, I mean, they've been working on this for a long time. They'll continue to work on it. We just need to make sure that we've got all the other ag organizations, everybody's pulling in the same harness and working together on that. Some other quick things, the, the labor issue. We need to come up with a plan. Can we get it done? Immigration is really tough. But at least we need a plan of what specifically do we want to do to address programs like H-2A and other immigrant visas to help that out, as well as, again, like I said, what can we do with workers here at home? As was already pointed out, we're putting together a task force right now to look at what specific changes can we try to make to things like LRP, and what specific changes can we make uh, for, uh, for beginning farmer and rancher programs? Long-term, and I like the long-term approach, a lot of the long-term approach, I, I mean, that'll take in policy issues, some of the ones that are harder and take longer to get done, but we also look at the educational issues with that. How do we keep working with our members on, on programs for succession planning and estate planning, and, and how do we how do we drive sustainability in these operations through that education? And, and I guess anytime several people have mentioned education, I just did, anytime I talk education, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention them. They're all hiding in the back of the room, but you know, Shrikla, Darren, Carl Yeoman, there's folks in the back of the room. When we talk education, there are partners that we need to call on. A lot of sustainability comes from finding new technology, new ways to improve your existing businesses. So that's a partner we haven't mentioned much yet, but we're going to be depending on them. Well, thank you guys. Help me thank the officers. They have taken a lot of time away from their operations to get to these listening sessions. Um, thank you all for being a part of the conversation, obviously, the success of the producer profitability um, initiative and the listening sessions was because of you showing up, sharing your stories. And like I said at the beginning, we don't want those stories to end. We don't want your feedback to end. This is going to be a continued focus um, and conversation as we continue to grow and build out solutions. But again, wanted to thank you for being a part of that. We will be around, the rest of our board obviously will be around for the rest of the convention. And we invite you to grab us, share your stories, share your thoughts. Uh, we, we are trying to document everything that we uh, receive feedback from and look forward to continuing this conversation. And last but not least, again, want to thank all of the auction markets, sale barns, um, individual contributors, as well as the um, Western Ranch Supply MBI for your cooler donations. That really did help make the um, event uh, a huge success. So thank you, and we look forward to talking to you more about producer profitability soon. <laughs>